Um, right, so our speaker will be Randy Beard, who's a professor at Brigham Young University, presenting visual multiple target tracking on Lee groups. I guess I should start by saying, uh, Patricio, I thought that was awesome. And I love that idea of uh, trajectory servoing. So anyways, uh, great talk. <clears throat> um, yeah, and thank you, uh, Nick, for inviting me again to, uh, to say something at this, uh, at this workshop. So hopefully, um, hopefully I have something that's interesting. Um, we are, uh, uh, our motivation really is trying to uh, track targets from the air using a fixed wing vehicle or a multi-rotor vehicle, things like wildlife monitoring, et cetera. These are the types of applications that we're looking at. And the last, uh, the last workshop, I gave this uh, a talk where I kind of talked about the overall architecture and the things that we were doing, really focused on this visual front end, but uh, touching on different pieces. Uh, today, I wanted to describe some of the recent things we've been doing with this uh, target tracker where we're uh, uh, trying to uh, extend it to more, um, I guess, more natural uh, uh, motion models. So this is a video, hopefully you can see this video just fine. Um, this, uh, this uh, I want, want to focus on this car right here that's about to do a U-turn. You, you'll notice when it does a U-turn, it sort of loses the track and then there was a new, a new track that was created. And this happens a lot with, the, uh, with uh, target tracking from video, um, where uh, if, the, if the motion is sophisticated at all, the, um, uh, you, you may lose track and then, for example, you might uh, initiate a new track, uh, but the idea is, is we'd like to hang on to that through the motion. And this type of thing, this was a U-turn using a constant uh, jerk, uh, linear time invariant constant jerk model, uh, but similar things happen with constant velocity or constant acceleration models. So what happens, you know, why, why do we get this sort of lost track? Um, so with a linear model, if you have, for example, a, a linear time invariant constant velocity model, it looks something like this, where you have a position, maybe in 3D, it might be in 2D if it's, if it's uh, image space. Um, so position dot is equal to velocity, and then velocity dot is zero, but you've got some um, uh, 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 Gaussian random variable that's driving that. And so uh, what happens is, you know, you start with your prior track, you're always predicting that the velocity vector at least um, has a, a certain direction. And so with prediction, you get the, uh, you know, your covariance grows, you get a measurement within the gate, and then that shrinks back down. Um, if, uh, if you have uh, something that's, you know, if your track is, is uh, turning, um, then uh, what happens is uh, your prediction is always going to be straightforward. If the measurement happens to lie within the, uh, the measurement gate, <clears throat> then of course you're going to uh, do an update and it will slowly pull the, uh, the estimate and the covariance bound uh, with it through this curve. Uh, but, and so, you, you know, the, the thing is you, you have this uh, true motion that might be uh, a curve, um, but you're always predicting something where the velocity vector uh, is you know you're 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 pushing something along a constant direction, and uh, this will fail or it can diverge when the gate's too small, which really relates to the process noise. If the process noise is too small, uh, then you can diverge, or if the time step is too large, uh, you also diverge. So you know you could uh, increase the time step, but that's often not possible with uh, visual systems. Um, and so the other option really is to increase the process noise. So increasing the process noise, um, the problem is it has its disadvantages as well. When you increase the process noise, you may start picking up other tracks if, if uh, it's a multiple target tracking scenario, or you could start picking up clutter. And so uh, increasing the process noise makes the system much more sensitive to clutter, more sensitive to nearby targets. And this is true whether you use a, a interacting multiple model uh, scenario or, um, you know, you try to increase the complexity of the LTI model, uh, you still get these types of, of issues happening. So um, we can solve this problem, of course, using a, a nonlinear uh, model. So this is a Dubin's-like uh, uh, model where you've got, in this case, we would assume constant velocity, constant angular velocity. 
And uh, in this case, uh, you know, we model these uh, at least uh, circular orbits and things like that quite well. And so uh, this type of model does a better job. Uh, so just think in the, in the context of uh, constant velocity models, this type of model does a lot better with uh, ground vehicles, um, pedestrians, wildlife, which uh, may not, uh, you know, <laughs> they, they don't always walk in, in straight lines uh, per se, but also uh, fixed wing uh, aircraft. So with fixed wing aircraft, uh, if we model with, uh, uh, let's say SE2, SE3, the constant velocity trajectories, you have straight lines, but also orbits and, and helices and things like that. Um, there's also the issue with uh, uncertainty propagation. Um, of course, with the linear time invariant model, um, we're always assuming that uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the uncertainty is propagated as a, a, uh, these ellipsoid uh, Gaussian covariances. So in this case, you know, you would think of um, small deviations in the north velocity and the east velocity, let's say. But uh, uh, real trajectory, you know, real vehicles um, uh, may deviate in terms of linear speed and angular speed, which uh, results more in these uh, banana type distributions where you have va variations in linear speed and variations in angular speed. And so, uh, you know, nonlinear models uh, have the potential to capture uh, this type of uncertainty behavior much better, or uncertainty propagation. Okay, so I want to talk now for a, a brief moment about kind of how the recursive ransack algorithm works, and then show uh, what we need to do and how we've extended that to these uh, nonlinear models. Okay, so uh, the idea is uh, we've got an aerial vehicle that's viewing, uh, you know, some scene and collecting a bunch of measurements. And uh, let's say for uh, the moment it col collects this uh, measurement, uh, ZK, and then it has in its memory uh, bank uh, uh, past measurements. And uh, one time step back, it may have collected multiple measurements, um, you know, and so what you want to do is now find trajectories that are consistent with the current measurement, but are uh, predicted by the, the prior measurements. So what we do is we randomly go back in time uh, over a, a particular window, select uh, time instances, and then uh, each of those time instances may have, let's say, multiple measurements. So we select randomly one of those measurements, and then we fit a... Uh, a trajectory to it using a linear time invariant model. And I'll, I'll describe in a little more detail uh, how we do that. Um, and then we repeat this in a ransack uh, sort of way. Uh, essentially what we're doing is a randomized search for uh, consistent trajectories um, so that we can fit uh, a track to these measurements. So we, we may find multiple uh, tracks. And then what we do is we score each of those tracks. Uh, and in the past, what we've been doing is using this, uh, uh, what we call an inlier ratio. Essentially, you know, you, you go backwards in time, you find an initial uh, uh, state, and then you propagate that forward using a Kalman filter. And then what we do is we look at the innovation gate uh, at each step and we fit all of the measure, all the measurements that are inside there, we just count those up and uh, we call that the, uh, the inlier ratio, uh, that divided by the, the total number and we call that the inlier ratio. And that's how we decide which are good tracks and which are not, those tracks that have a lot of measurements that support, the, uh, uh, support that particular track. And then when we get a new measurement, we simply uh, push all of the existing tracks forward uh, in a prediction step using a Kalman filter. And then we update, uh, we find every, you know, the measurements, uh, if, uh, or the current measurement, uh, we find all of the tracks where the innovation term is small uh, or are the tracks, I guess, are within the gate of the measurement. Um, I, I, I don't know, I guess, uh, or thinking about it the other way. Um, <clears throat> and then we do the update. Of course, at every, at every time step, if we have multiple uh, measurements, then we, uh, we might initiate another track using this ransack process. Okay, and then we prune tracks that have low support. If tracks uh, interact uh, or uh, cross, then we use a probabilistic data association filter. In fact, we're, uh, because we have lots of measure with visual data, you get lots of measurements. Um, 
and a lot of clutter, we're always using this probabilistic data association filter to propagate things forward. <clears throat> so this, uh, this is uh, an old video, but it uh, kind of illustrates what's going on underneath the hood. You have these different tracks, and these tracks are a constant uh, uh, jerk model. So you'll see the tracks kind of speed up over time. Uh, anything that's orange are sort of these bad tracks that don't necessarily get validated. And then things that have a good inlier ratio, the second number is the inlier ratio. And, and those tracks, we, uh, we give a track number and, and propagate forward. And so, you know, uh, things that are moving in straight lines tend to um, uh, become good tracks. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit more about this track initialization uh, problem. What we do, uh, this, none of this really matters, but uh, what we do is we solve a maximum likelihood problem where we're trying to maximize the uh, you know, maximize or find the state that maximizes the likelihood function where these measurements are, uh, uh, you know, these, these past measurements that we've selected, always keeping um, the, the current measurement uh, in, in that, uh, in that uh, collection of, of measurements. And what happens is we end up with this, uh, this matrix times, you know, measurement data and this matrix depends on, you know, basically the state, or I mean the system, uh, this linear time invariant model. And uh, it, it essentially, you know, we can form this matrix once. And so the initialization problem becomes very easy because we can, uh, uh, we basically can, you know, uh, we, we plug in the measurement data and we can generate new tracks. And so it's, it's solved in a uh, closed form way. Um, other places where we use linear models, we've got, of course, the Kalman filter, uh, and then um, all of these things like uh, finding the inlier ratio or good tracks, uh, measurement fusion, uh, we have a way of uh, fusing in uh, multiple measurement sources, but they depend on the, uh, the measurements and states uh, being elements of vector spaces, and track fusion depends on this linear time invariant uh, idea as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, th these are kind of all the things that have to happen inside this tracker. And the things that are read are uh, things that are e either depend explicitly on linear time invariant models or the idea that the state and the measurements come from vector spaces. All right, so what happens if, they, uh, if, if they're not elements of, uh, or if they're not linear or not elements in the vector space? So just uh, kind of as uh, motivation, I'm sorry, uh, all these equations, um, but uh, this is the way I was thinking about things. You know, we have this model. Of course, if we, uh, if we make an element of SE2 in terms of a rotation matrix and a, a position vector, when we differentiate, we get this differential equation that is, you know, basically an element of SE2. Um, and then you're, you're multiplying by this uh, velocity vector. And the velocity vector has a, a constant uh, linear velocity and constant angular, or linear speed and, and angular speed. So we basically can model this system in terms of this, uh, this group evolution equation. And then uh, of course the linear or the, the velocity, this would be a constant velocity model. The velocity uh, is constant with uh, perhaps noise. And so the state becomes, um, you know, an element of a Lie group and then an element of a vector space. Uh, this co corresponding to something like a pose and a velocity. And this is, uh, this is a semi-direct product uh, group. And so, uh, you know, the, the key here to note also is that the dimension of uh, the, the state space. So G may, for example, be a three by three matrix, but it's uh, evolving on an orientation and uh, position. So it's really a three-dimensional quantity. Um, so uh, things like, um, you know, uh, vehicles on the ground uh, are well modeled by these types of, uh, of these, these types of systems. Okay, so, um, and that's of course a, a Lie group, uh, a SE, SE2 forms a Lie group. So we can extend this idea to a little bit more general Lie groups. And, and this, uh, this slide is busy, but um, basically we have uh, for any uh, Lie group, so think of maybe, uh, you know, elements on this sphere as, as being elements of a Lie group, and then you've got a tangent space. Uh, and if, if you're at the identity, that's the Lie algebra. 
uh, and then an element of the tangent space can map through the exponential function to geodesics on this um, on this manifold. So we have an exponent. The exponential function takes an element of the group, something in the Lie algebra, and maps it back to the group through this geodesic, uh, and then the log uh, function kind of goes in the opposite direction. And so uh, we can extend that to the semi-direct uh, product group where we've got something that's an element of a Lie algebra plus a vector space. And then uh, the tangent space to the vector space is again, you know, if this is R2, this will be R2 as well. And so when we uh, compose those, it's just, uh, we're just summing. And then the Lie group, we get uh, the exponential. So basically uh, things that, uh, you know, in vector spaces, when we see a plus, uh, when we go to these Lie group um, to Lie groups, we can replace the pl the plus with an exponential, and the minus with a logarithm, and that really gives us the tool to do all of this uh, uh, mapping. So, just kind of as a first step, uh, you have the uh, 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 continuous time model integrated. If we assume that the uh, the velocity is constant over a time step, then we get models that look like this. Q1 and Q2 are going to be noise. So this would be noise, for example, on the linear uh, speed, noise on the angular uh, speed. And uh, then we've got our time step here. And we can wrap all that into this, uh, to this function. Um, and then when we go to uncertainty, um, uh, what happens, I guess, if we want to say what's the uh, the probability distribution of some some state that's modeled now in this semi-direct product group, um, you think of uh, so so we can't just subtract uh, x from x hat. So what we have to do is take x from x hat, you know, in a log use the logarithm to basically subtract, which pushes things onto this tangent space. So x tilde is going to lie in tangent space. And then um, the tangent space is actually a vector space. So we can uh, do our normal uh, uh, Gaussian distributions on the, on the tangent space. And the same thing with measurement distributions. You, you want to look at the distribution around um, some z. It's basically going to be, you take the logarithm of z and z hat, and that pushes it onto the tangent space of the measurement. And then uh, we can look at the normal uh, Gaussian distributions. All right, so how do we do um, track initialization? Uh, track initialization, again, we assume measurements are gonna be some element of a, of a lead group, and then we've got our evolution. And what, we're, what we basically do is initialize tracks. Again, uh, going back to the linear time invariant case, we initialize tracks with the, by solving the uh, maximum likelihood problem. We could do it in closed form. Uh, in this particular case, we can't do it in closed form. We do it numerically, but we're solving basically a large uh, uh, maximum likelihood problem numerically. And uh, this, this is okay, um, uh, but uh, can be uh, numerically uh, intensive. It turns out that uh, we, can, we can simplify the problem um, quite a bit if we assume these constant velocity type models. So in some cases, this is what we what we do. So for example, let, let's just go down to the linear time invariant case. You know, if you if you can measure the position, then you're you could initialize by taking the measurement as the position measurement, uh, as the pos position estimate. And then if you take the measurement, you know, the position minus some previous position several time steps before and divide by the by the time, then that would give you an initialization of the of the velocity. And this is the same way you could do it the same types of things with these Lie group uh, models just by using the log, uh, the log function to get the velocity instead. Um, but uh, actually, uh, all of the simulations I'll show you are, are actually solving the uh, maximum likelihood problem numerically. And then uh, uh, kind of a little more difficult uh, is how do you do the uh, propagation and finding the, um, uh, the, the likelihood of the track. So um, we're essentially, we've extended this idea of the, uh, the integrated probabilistic data association filter. And uh, let me just give you a highlight of, of what that is. So this is uh, not with Lie groups, but you know, basically um, you've got a true state, you have your estimated state and a bunch of measurements, you have a measurement gate, and then everything within this measurement gate, 
we're going to basically uh, we're going to do a measurement update. Okay, so when we do a measurement update, essentially the tracks split into all of these different potential uh, tracks, and then what we do is we fuse these based on the probability of of the measurement. Uh, to get a fused uh, track. And then uh, the, the integrated uh, uh, part uh, computes the, the likelihood that, uh, or the probability that this is actually a true track. And so we use that for like this inlier ratio. So this is kind of the, you know, what, what happens. You've got this, you, you have your state, um, you add this uh, track likelihood, Things get propagated just like a standard uh, extended Kalman filter. Um, you have your measurement gate to find measurements that are within that gate. And then what you do is you look at the innovation for every term. You come down and you do a, a, a Kalman update. Um, and then uh, given that Kalman update, you combine all of the, all of the potential updates based on this, uh, this beta function, which are functions of the probability that the measurement, you know, of the, of the measurement, uh, or I guess of the estimated, of the measurement given the estimated uh, measurement. And then there's a way to update the covariances as well. Uh, and then the track likelihood gets updated uh, uh, in this way. Again, it's a, it's a function of the likelihood that all of these measurements truly came from the track. Okay, so um, I'm uh, 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 so now if we want to move that to lead groups, um, the propagation phase is fairly easy. We're what we're going to be doing is uh, instead of doing a standard extended Kalman filter, we do a uh, uh, an air state uh, Kalman filter. So we propagate in the normal way, but then the covariance is uh, propagating the air state uh, covariance. Um, uh, similarly, you know, every time we find the innovation, we're going to be using a log term, and then you know we use the proper covariances, um, and then we do this would be the uh, essentially the the Kalman update step, um, you know, finds mu, and then it updates through an exponential function instead of adding, and so these this is uh, what we what you need to do to uh, to extend this to uh, to lead groups. And then actually, once we find all of these potential tracks, uh, we fuse those together in a normal way because this is in the, uh, this is actually in the Lie algebra. Um, and then of course we have, uh, oh, and then, and then the state gets uh, propagated through an exponential function. And then uh, we have uh, a similar uh, method uh, to the standard uh, IPDAF uh, for updating the covariance. Okay, so um, in terms of uh, results, uh, this is a uh, this is a simulation. Um, you'll see lots of measurements coming in, and lots of false tracks getting uh, created, and then the track where the probability that the track is a, is associated with the target, uh, we turn that green, and you'll see it's uh, it's associated with it's actually overlaid on top of the true track, um, and so it's doing a pretty good job. Um, this next slide, uh, so now we kind of put it in, you know, the, the camera is moving, we have multiple targets. I'm sorry, the quality of this video is really bad. Uh, there's multiple, again, there's multiple targets inside here. It turns out, uh, if you could see this a little bit better, that they're all uh, tracking true targets. So the, these, um, um, these graphs show things a little bit better. Uh, as the number of valid targets uh, grows, um, you know, uh, basically the, um, or I'm sorry, this is the number of valid targets, and this is time, and uh, you'll notice that, uh, you know, the, the Lee group version, I guess, uh, does a pretty good job of, of finding the total number of valid targets for the uh, um, linear time invariant constant velocity based recursive ransack algorithm uh, does worse. And the same with uh, the number of missed targets. Um, this is a, uh, these are some flight tests that we did. Um, these are the same video on the right and on the left are the same uh, videos. Uh, one processed with constant velocity, uh, Lie group model, you know, SE, assuming everything's on SE2 and the other one, uh, just a constant velocity linear time invariant model. 
Um, you'll notice, you know, this, the one on the left actually occasionally has uh, issues as well, but does much better job of holding on to targets, especially as they run around and, and turn and, and uh, do different things. Um, all right, so we've extended this uh, recursive ransack multiple target tracking idea to uh, nonlinear Lie group models uh, with the intent of trying to uh, do a better job of tracking targets as they move uh, in, I guess, non-straight uh, trajectories. Uh, so part of that, we had to do this track initialization. And really, it's uh, you, you have to solve a fixed, win a fixed window maximum likelihood estimation problem. And then uh, we've spent a lot of time recently extending the uh, IPDAF uh, filter to, uh, to lead groups. And then implementation shows that we are getting uh, some uh, performance uh, benefits, uh, both in simulation and also in flight test. All right, that's all I have. Thanks, Randy, for the amazing talk. Uh, Nick asked me to share the end of this talk and start with a new one. So I'm going to see if there are any questions in the chat. And I have a couple, actually, maybe to break the ice, I can go ahead and ask. Um, so, so the the talk uh, and the, the cool extensions that you had. My understanding was it's based on SE two. Is that correct, or does it apply to SE three as well? Yeah, actually, everything we've done extends to, um, in general, to. Uh, these uh, semi direct product groups where you've got an element of a Lie group. So it doesn't necessarily have to be SE2. Um, it's just all my examples were SE2 to make it uh, relatively easy to, to understand what's going on. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Um, and but being fair, we have only tested things with SE2 and SE3. <laughs> I see. Yeah. So, so regarding that, uh, perhaps another question. So I, I noted that in the, uh, the drone video that you had, um, for the most part, the targets were inside the field of view. Yeah. And this kind of connects to what uh, Warren, uh, Warren Dixon at the beginning of the workshop, he, had, he showed the videos that, uh, you know, you had robots that would go outside the field of view and then at some, some point come back again and you were able to track them again. Is, is this functionality of re-ID and, uh, you know, tracking things again, associating them the same ID if, if they're lost, is, is that? integrated in the filter or it's, if not, is it something easy to integrate? Um, so I would say, uh, so um, it's not necessarily a part of the, uh, of, of the filter. Uh, we have this, we've kind of built up our, what we call the, uh, uh, our visual MTT, you know, visual multiple target tracking. So we have this, um, we have this functionality where when things uh, go outside of the field of view, we basically keep track of, uh, of uh, you know, an image or kind of uh, small images of, of the track. And then when things get, when tracks get reinitialized, we correlate those with things that are in our database. And so sometimes when things have gone outside the field of view for a long period of time, uh, and then they come back in, we actually can uh, reassociate. Um, when they go out for a small period of time, the track doesn't get lost. And so they come back in and we can actually uh, reassociate, but it's, uh, you know, after a couple of seconds, essentially the, the track is lost. And um, so you have to do something, at least in our framework, there's something else you have to do to reassociate that, that track with a, with a previous track. Got it, got it, it's very, very cool. And since we're running out of time, I wanna, I, th I think Warren asked a quick question, so I'm gonna, and the talk with that is asking if uh, this is running in real time and what is the computation of this? Yeah, this is running in real time. So uh, we th this particular video is running on a desktop. Um, our, I guess, uh, the linear time invariant uh, case we have running on uh, a, a TX2 uh, at uh, about 20 hertz. Um, and so, uh, yeah. I guess the Lee group extension, we haven't put on a TX2 yet, uh, but it does run in real time on a desktop uh, computer. So I guess um, 
Yeah, the real question is once once we do so the maximum likelihood uh, as you know because we have to do this many different times as we initialize tracks uh, that actually is computationally intense. So okay. uh, there there is a question of whether we might be able to do that on an embedded processor, but we, we that's why we think we we have a workaround if it's uh, if we're doing things like SE two or SE three. Yeah, thanks again for the great talk. Appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks for being with us on Sunday. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me.